Hello. Uh, it's 11.45 a.m. here in Maryland, so let's get started. Welcome to Session 7, Adapting Data Curation at NLM. My name is Susan Schmidt. I am a member of the index section within Library Operations of NLM, and I am very happy to be here chairing the session. I'm going to keep my session introduction brief because this is a shortened session, and I know that most you most want to hear from our speakers. We have five researchers, excuse me, data curation scientists from NLM who will be discussing curation at scale efforts and adapting curation from a variety of perspectives, from entity recognition and curation of the literature to annotation of SARS-CoV-2 sequence data. As I said, this session is slightly shorter than previous sessions and we are limited to 15 minutes per speaker. Speakers, I know you're keeping track of time, but as we get to about the 13 minute mark of your presentation, I will unmute and give you the two minute warning so that we can stay on time and allow for a question or two at the end of your presentation. I wanna remind attendees again to put their questions in the Q&A. Please be sure to identify to whom you are addressing your question. So let's get started with what I know is going to be a really interesting series of presentations. Our first presentation is by Jim Mork, and it is NLM Curation Using the Medical Text Indexer. Jim is the technical lead of the NLM Medical Text Indexer project, and he works closely with NLM index section staff to combine their human domain expertise with natural language processing technology to support curation of the biomedical literature at scale. So please take it away, Jim. Thanks, Susan. And thank you for the uh, workshop organizers uh, for asking me to talk about how the medical text indexer fits into the indexing and curation stream at NLM. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of what I'm talking about when I say indexing. And then we'll go into a little bit about the, the tool and how, how it's progressed over time. So if you go into PubMed, you're going to see an article that looks sort of like this. And if an indexer has indexed that article, they have added the metadata elements, the publication type, so they can describe what type of an article this is. They've added mesh terms to indicate what's important about this article and any substances that were important uh, in the article as well. So there's a lot of metadata added by the indexers. To give you an idea of what that means at NLM, um, the, the scale is roughly about 800,000 articles were manually indexed last year and 400,000 citations were automatically indexed. There's a relatively small number of indexers and they're indexing from a little over 5,000 article or in journals that are broken down into 126 different categories or what we call journal descriptors. So you might have something like veterinary medicine or botany. Now, every one of these indexers has to be able to, to know the over 30,000 descriptors that MeSH has, 76 qualifiers that could be put onto those 30,000 descriptors. And, and well over 300,000 supplementary concept records that they have to be able to bring to every article that they look at. As of January 4th of 2021, we had almost 580,000 citations that were in process, meaning that they needed to be indexed. Um, as early as 1996, Dr. Lindbergh recognized that the human indexes were going to need some assistance. And he created the indexing initiative, which was a cross library team that was to explore indexing methodologies that could help the indexers and ensure that Medline and the NLM document collections maintain their quality and currency as, as the workload increased over time. The result of that was the NLM medical text indexer. And as it mentions here, it combines the human indexing expertise and natural language processing. We've worked very hard over the years and very closely with indexers to understand how they do the process as well as what rules they use uh, when they come to an article and how, how do they decide what's really important in an article. 
to give you a little frame of reference before I go into all the different types of MTI that we have, um, this is a scale of from the left, the most human involvement, which is manual indexing, to the targeted human creation, which will be fully automatic uh, MTI. So we have MTI as a first line indexing indexer, which was M MTI provided the initial indexing for an article and a indexer, human indexer would look at the full text and they would decide uh, if they needed to add anything or remove anything that MTI had indicated. And then MTI review was the human indexer looks at only the title and abstract since MTI is only, only looking at title and abstract and not the full text. This was a way for us to determine, you know, was MTI doing well enough on a journal that we could move it into fully automatic or not? And then we have uh, fully automatic indexing. One thing to note is that full scale manual indexing ends actually tomorrow, but the, the human curation process for quality controls, genes, proteins, and other items that MTI does not do well at are, is going to continue to ensure the quality is maintained. There, there's a lot here in the roadmap. And, and as, as a lot of the speakers had mentioned earlier, two years ago, uh, there's a lot of the talk that I wouldn't have been able to say because um, we weren't there yet. A couple of the main things, uh, back in 2011, MTI is a first line indexer. We, we noticed that MTI was doing really well on, on a particular set of journals. So we started to allow it to be the first indexer and then have the human come in and revise that indexing. In 2015, th there is a, a subset in Medline called Old Medline. And these are articles that were indexed prior to the MeSH vocabulary being established. And those terms had been added to the keyword section and not as MeSH terms in the uh, literature. So what we did was we automatically reprocessed those 2 million articles. And the, the goal was to add current terminology. So for example, if an old article maybe had consumption, uh, the new M MTI would automatically add tuberculosis in those cases. Um, and we would add any new terms that may have come along since uh, these were indexed. And it, it just freshened up the indexing for those 2 million articles. In 2017, we started automatically indexing comments. This was just an expansion of what NLM was already doing, which was, was automatically, um, if an article commented on another article, the mesh terms from that, that commented on article would just be added to the comment. So what we've done with MTI is we've, we've taken the, the new article and re-indexed it as well as using the, um, the title from the, the previous article. As we were doing the automation and expanding it, we realized that people using the data were going to want to have a method to determine what was automatically indexed and what was not automatically indexed. So in 2018, we added an XML tag called the indexing method. And that spells out if it was automatically indexed if it was curated by a human, meaning that it was a mix of automatic and human. And if there's no indexing method, it means it was fully indexed by a human. And in 2019, we started uh, the MTI review and the MTIA process. One of the things that we've done over the years is tried to support the indexers and in helping them with their, their indexing efforts. And what we do is we, when we index an article, we provide the human with a tab, uh, a note saying, well, this is COVID-19 related. This is fairly recent. Um, are there any clinical trial registry information? Are there any proteins or genes which MTI doesn't do well at? And that's just to give the heads, a heads up to the indexer. Um, here you can see where we highlighted that we added a randomized controlled trial publication type. And here in the text is where we got it from. This is a great example of an article um, that has, how MTI has really improved over the years. Uh, back in 2007, 
the idea was MTI would provide a really long list of recommendations to an indexer with the hope that most of the right terms were in the upper part of the list, but basically giving the indexer a pick list. And what we quickly realized from the indexers was we were causing them more trouble than we were actually helping them. They would look through the list and wonder, oh, did I miss something in the article? And then have to maybe go back and, and look. Uh, so we've made improvements over that time. And in 2016, you can see the, uh, the recall came up a little bit, but the precision almost doubled in that time period. So we gave them a much smaller list. We got rid of a lot of the bad terms. And then now with uh, automatic indexing, we're now um, at very high precision and very high recall. I, I would add that the young adult here actually could be indexed uh, because it does fit in with the, the age range that was stated in the article. So in reality, we might actually be doing a little bit better for this article. Ambiguity and metaphors, or as I like to say, the bane of MTI. Authors, and, and quite honestly, I'm guilty of this as anyone, they like to use metaphor and they like to use ambiguous terms. Um, we track 180 of these terms right now that are typically used. Um, falling is a really good example. Um, that maps to the mesh term accidental falls. But um, are you falling off the ladder as an academic? or did you fall off the ladder and actually hurt yourself? Um, is it a falling risk of some disease or some activity, or is it a falling risk of susceptibility? So it, it, it's hard sometimes for the, for the automatic programs to identify these, these metaphorical uses. Um, elephant is another great example where you have people talking about the, the elephant and blind men, or the elephant in the room. Uh, machine learning should clear up a lot of these issues about ambiguity, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna 100% solve the problem because authors continue to find different ways to, to restate the same metaphor. Uh, as with everyone else, we had to pivot for the COVID-19 and we were continually adding new terms to, as Mesh was adding new terms to, uh, so that MTI would find them. Uh, there was a big struggle early on as, as the naming of what COVID-19 was going to be. Um, and what's coming up next? Uh, as part of the Medline 2022 project, we're implementing uh, a new indexing methods to ensure timely assignment of mesh terms. There is a new medical text indexer uh, machine learning program that we've been working on for, I guess, three or four years now on Alistair Ray is getting very good results with that. We're looking to integrate this into the PubMed data management system. The goal here is that when a publisher uploads a new article, it should, it should go and be indexed, um, not instantaneously, but within 24 hours, it should see indexing assigned to it. We need to continue to improve and expand the capabilities and the availability of um, full text and use. NLM is working with our publishers to expand the, the automatic system access to this full text. And further strides towards automation and assuring continued quality product with human review. I'd like to thank Florence Chang, especially um, as the original developer of MTI. And as with any project that is this long in duration, there is a multitude of people who have helped out and helped improve it over time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for that excellent presentation, giving us information about MTI. And you came in right at time. We have just a, a, about a minute left. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I have a quick question for you. So have you tried machine learning on the ambiguity metaphors previously, since it sounds like this has been really a problem for MTI for quite a while? Uh, that's a good question, Susan. Yeah, we, we tried early on when machine learning started coming back up. So we were, I mean, this was eight, nine years ago, I guess. Uh, we did not get very good results, but now with a lot of the new machine learning and deep learning methods, I think we're going to get probably close to 90 to 95% there. There's still going to be those rare cases where an author just 
decides to switch a metaphor around and we're not going to know about it because we haven't seen it before. Um, but yeah, we, we have tried it before. Not very successful, but I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, we're seeing really good results with Alistair's code. So I think, I think there's a huge improvement there with, with what he's doing. Okay, thank you so much, Jim. I think you, you have a question too in the chat, but I'm gonna move on, keep us on track here uh, okay. with our next presentation. <laughs> thank you so much again. Thank you. Uh, next, our second presentation is from Rosada Islami and Richine Jean and Chemical Links in Biomedical Literature. Rosada has a PhD in computer scientist, excuse me, computer science, and is a staff scientist at NCBI at NLM. She's a member of the Text Mining Research Program. Her research focus recently has been on computer-assisted biomedical data curation, such as coordinating curation efforts to develop gold standard lexical resources for biomedical text mining, building efficient, intuitive, and interactive annotation systems, and developing algorithms for biomedical named entity recognition and information extraction. She has served as an organizer for several community challenges, such as biocreative workshops, and on interoperability of data and tools, facilitating data sharing and text annotations for better text mining. So please take it away, Rosara. Good. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you for the interest. Uh, I'm Rizarda Islam, and I will be talking to you today about our newest resources, NLM Chem and NLM Gene, and their importance in improving the identification of genes and chemicals in biomedical literature. Identification of biomedical entities, such as genes and chemicals, is key to accurate article retrieval. As depicted in this slide, you see a typical PubMed search, which starts with a query and expects a list of articles relevant to that query. On the right, you see a list of frequently asked PubMed queries. Genes and chemicals are one of the most searched entities in PubMed. People search for such entities because they want to understand their biology, their sequence, their structure, their interaction with other molecular entities as well as their cause and effect on human health. But their correct identification is not limited on the article retrieval. They are important for classification, for indexing, as, as Jim uh, talked earlier, and further understanding of the text. So when we talk about gene identification in PubMed, what does it exactly mean to find a gene in biomedical literature? As shown on this slide, uh, we aim to identify the correct NCBI gene database ID for a gene name that we find mentioned in the text. And going on to chemicals, what does it mean to find a chemical in the biomedical literature? As shown on this slide, we aim to identify the correct medical subject heading or MESH ID for a chemical name mentioned in the text. Uh, shown in this picture also, uh, disease names that we mesh to uh, mesh identifiers. By improving the identification of genes and chemicals in the biomedical literature, our direct result would be an improved information retrieval for related articles, as well as improved linking of NLM resources. Their correct recognition is important to ensure high quality links between various NLM resources, which in turn, helps improve classification, retrieval, and text understanding. We, our group, have been working on identification of genes for a long time. Um, Jean mentioned several of our projects earlier in his talk in section one. Our tool, Genome Plus, developed by uh, Wei, our, my colleague Wei, has been state-of-the-art for some time. Shown here are the results of Genome Plus corpus, mainly consisting of human genes. The chart also shows a detailed depiction of the algorithm, but in the interest of time, I will not have time to go into that. 
We have also been working on identification of chemicals for quite a long time. And our tool, Tagger One, developed by Robert Lehman, has been state of the art for some time. Shown here is our result on the BC5 CDR chemical disease corpus consisting of PubMed titles and abstracts, annotated for chemical entities, mapped to mesh identifiers. And the chart shows a depiction of the algorithm. Our goals are kind of ambitious. They um, and they require robust algorithms because we need these algorithms to adapt to the new topics in the literature while capable of maintaining the accuracy. Um, and in order to do this, in order to achieve this, such gold standard data is required that is rich in the entities which current NER tools have trouble identifying. And as well, they should have no restrictions on sharing and distribution and are useful for further downstream tasks. Therefore, the objectives for our current and future gene identification work call for not only accurate identification of the genes in previously unseen articles, but let me um, expand a little bit on the idea on what Jung started with his talk on the variants there. We need reliable gene identification on articles mentioning multiple species. On articles mentioning species other than human, what will we do? We do very well in human. Or um, as well as then uh, linking this to, to Jim's talk, uh, assisting human indexing and linking of genes and PubMed databases as well as other NLM resources. And a response to this, we developed the NLM gene corpus to address the fact that oftentimes the articles in PubMed mention multiple species. They contain a larger than expected number of genes mentioned in their title and abstracts, or discuss genes in relation to other important bioentities such as chemicals, diseases, mutations, cell lines. And similarly for chemicals, um, our current and future work aims not only for accurate identification of chemicals in, unseen, in previously unseen articles, but reliable chemical identification going beyond title and abstract, but to the full text. Because uh, um, oftentimes the title and abstract do not provide adequate coverage for all the chemicals that are mentioned in the full text. Um, so we need to go in the methods section, in figures and table captions, in the results, which are the, the sections that are um, the bio-curation scientists, the, the curators, that know where they go to find and, I, and, and notice the particular valuable information pertaining to chemical properties and their interactions with other molecular entities. And this is why we developed the NLM CHEM to address um, these issues. So those, um, there's challenges. There's challenges, there's our known challenges, such as uh, identifying all the very different ways typographically that the authors can use to refer to the same entity, both for genes and chemicals, and genes are shown here in the, in the blue box and chemicals in the green one. Um, and authors are, of course, very creative. They can use a variety of lexical variants to refer to the same entity. And with the, what I've listed here, they, they map to the same gene or to the same chemical. Or they use the same term to refer to different entities. For example, we can have the same gene term refer to genes of different organisms. We can have the same gene term refer to different genes of the same organism. We can have the same term that can refer to different bioentities, in this case, a gene and a disease, depending on the context. Or we can have a perfectly normal English word that refers to a gene and could also be an acronym for a laboratory technique. Ambiguity 
is, is challenging and the, the same, I could list ambiguity for chemicals as well. And just to illustrate why we need robust algorithms that are capable to adjust to abrupt changes in topics, please consider the recent pandemic and how it changed the landscape of biomedical literature. Uh, in, in this slide, you see two examples uh, from PubMed showing the distribution of articles containing a chemical before the COVID-19 pandemic in the last two years. Um, while some chemicals we had known before and they are uh, quite well represented, we know where to find them, how to identify them, how to index them. Some of them have only been seen only a handful of times. Um, so NLM gene and NLM chem resources are, are two resources to help us develop more robust algorithms for identifications of genes of chemicals. And I've shown you the results. Um, it's shown in these charts when combined with the previous gene corpus that we were using to train our gene finding algorithms, we have a better coverage of the space in terms of training data. The NLM gene contains um, 550 PubMed documents from 156 journals, and it was built by six NLM indexers. Uh, each of these articles on average contains 28 gene names per document. Um, or 10 different gene IDs per document. They're, these articles are very rich in, in, in gene information. And also we have different organisms well represented, giving us more valuable training data than the previous corpora. And we have also made marked improvements in the algorithms shown here in the light blue boxes, um, but I do not have time to go into them today. Um, did it improve our results? Definitely. We show we saw a marked improvement, and here I have highlighted not uh, in detail of how we got the improvement show just by the additional training data that our um, in, invaluable NLM bioeducation scientists um, create the resource for us, but also by adding uh, specifically the deep learning component in in the algorithm. And this is more information there. When we go to uh, chemicals, NLM Chem contains 150 full text articles annotated for chemicals from 61 open access journals. So data is free to distribute. And 10 by NLM indexers um, worked on, on creating this resource. Again, these articles are very rich on chemicals. 256 chemical names per document, uh, averaging to 35 different mesh identifiers for chemicals. And when uh, look at the difference on, on the data, training data that we have, when we compare um, the data that we could get only from titles and abstracts versus the full text, and as well as the expansion in the training data set when we combine with the previous corpus. And also with marked improvement on the algorithm, we we have similarly for as we got with the NLM gene, uh, we we have very marked improvement because of the new data set as well as the deep learning component added to the algorithm. So we've reached our objectives to foster development of accurate genes of chemicals tools to improve chemical identification in full text, to improve gene identification in PubMed. We do wish to assist NLM indexing, and here I will um, uh, give you one example um, for and how we can assist the gene linking. Gene linking is 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 a is a is a group is a program started in two thousand and one at the National Library of Medicine, and they manually link the uh, database gene IDs with the PubMed articles that contain reference infection to those genes. The table that I'm showing uh, shows the result of our NLM gene 
um, identification algorithm, the improved one, on a set of 30,000 PubMed articles, which were manually annotated from 2001 to now they were um, um, randomly selected from that set by the NLM indexers. And I've grouped the data here from organism and uh, we compare with previously how well we could do per species in bold we mark the cases where our improvement is statistically significant and we can do even than that even better than that we can um, uh, rank our articles where our automated met method provides very high confidence results versus articles where human input is needed to review um, the report of the automated methods. And usually those are articles where we have mentions of multiple um, species and, and very dense in, in gene information. Ms. Arda, excuse me, I'm just going to give you the, we're actually at about time here. So. Yes, I would like to I, acknowledge I, the incredible bioperation scientists of NLM, without whom we would not be able to create these high quality resources. And um, my colleagues with whom we work to develop the identification algorithms as well as the annotation tool. And John Blue, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions as time allows. Uh, we start, we're since, since I would really like to keep us on time so that we have that 10 minute break in between, you know, before the panel discussion, you do have a number of questions in the Q&A. So if you don't mind addressing those uh, by typing in your answers. Thank Excellent. you so much. I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next, our third speaker now, pre presentation by Rodney Brister is Improving Viral Sequence Data Interoperability Through Targeted Curation at Scale. Rodney is the Chief of Viral Resources at the National Center of Biotechnology at the National Library of Medicine. He leads teams involved in the curation of viral sequence data, and the construction of web and cloud-based data resources. Take it away, Rodney. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, really like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity today to talk to you about improving viral sequence data interoperability through targeted curation at scale. Oops. So there are a number of scientific communities engaged in sequencing viral samples. These include public health researchers, academic virologists and molecular biologists, ecologists and systems biologists. And each of these different communities is generating sequence data for different purposes and use cases. These include epidemiology, outbreak analysis and surveillance, as well as comparative genomics and viral discovery. And so the folks creating this uh, viral sequence data are typically making it available through the GenBank Sequence Repository. Uh, this is a critical platform for sharing genetic sequences across the globe. It's an open access annotated collection of publicly available nucleotide sequences, their protein translations, and associated sample metadata, like where the sequence was actually obtained, the host, the environmental conditions, et cetera. And GenBank is maintained by the National Center for Biotechnology Information at the National Library of Medicine. Now, over the past few years, the uh, GenBank repository has grown to include more than 7 million nucleotide and 28 million protein sequences. Um, these sequences are derived from the more than 10,000 species officially recognized by the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses. And of course, there are many, many more sequences that belong to other yet to be officially recognized species. So together, the volume and the, the, uh, the, the heterogeneity of the sequence set itself causes a lot of unique issues in the curation of viral sequence data. So how are these viral sequences used? They're used to compare new sequences to, comp uh, to previously characterized ones so that one can identify genetic variations and then associate those genetic variations with biological, clinical, and or environmental information to help define sequence to biology type relationships. And of course, others can construct models based on genetic comparisons to define evolutionary relationships and provide reagents for viral discovery. So how can curation contribute to the usability of these viral sequences? And as I mentioned, there is a, quite a diversity of content uh, among these viral sequences. And as we've thought about this problem over the last few years, we've identified four sort of very specific areas where we think we can add value through curation. The first is taxonomy validation, um, being able to 
retrieve a set of sequences based on a taxonomic term. It's a very key sort of use case within the um, bioinformatic analysis of sequences. And so we've uh, invested time in trying to correct taxon um, classifying sequences in the correct taxonomy categories. Sequence quality, uh, we've also invested effort into providing quality metrics. You know, different use cases require different quality of sequences and being able to quickly assess whether the sequences are good for a particular use case is quite critical. Sample descriptors has been discussed quite a bit today. Um, so the, the metadata that describes a sample and how it was isolated is, to, is often inconsistent. And being able to take this inconsistent uh, metadata and mapping it to standard vocabularies is really critical for both the search and analysis of sequences. And then finally, providing reference sequences. This is to say well annotated sequences that can be used as references in bioinformatic pro processes like comparisons, annotation tools, assemblies, et cetera, is also a really critical use case for curation. So this is the overview of our viral sequence data curation flow. Um, we are scanning uh, GenBank for viral sequences and then processing them, processing them. And our data flow here really stresses a couple of key concepts. One is to use automated curation processes when possible. So we have automated processes that classify sequences and assess their quality. Uh, we also have automated processes which uh, parse metadata fields and look for inconsistent vocabulary usage and then map, remap that to controlled vocabularies. We try to apply human data cura curation efforts where needed most. And that's really in development of the data curation strategies themselves. Uh, what are we trying to uh, normalize and how do we go about that? Um, maintaining things like metadata vocabulary mapping lists. And of course, examining failures and edge cases in our processing and using that uh, the knowledge gained through those examinations to improve those processes. We also try to use extant data structures and community organizations when possible. Um, we see ourselves as part of a community um, that is trying to improve data quality and accessibility and interoperability. And there are things that we can do well and there are things that other organizations can do well. So we try to collaborate with those involved in this community. So here's an example of how just a very simple set of data normalization procedures can lead to some really amazing results. So on the right, you're seeing normalized host information. And what I mean by that is we've processed all the viral records that, through GenBank and remapped the host field from inconsistent vocabulary to a standardized, standardized vocabulary. And we've done that by mapping directly to the NCBI taxonomy database which not only gives us access to scientific names, but also allows us to glean other information stored in that database, such as common names. And on the left, you can see that we have classified all the sequences that have come through GenBank into ICTB approved taxa, or grouped them into temporary unclassified bins. And what this allows us to do is basically say, what viruses, what viral families, gen uh, genera, and species um, are are associated with pigs. So I've selected on the right, uh, Suscro um, <laughs> I can't read that, Suscrocia, which is pig in Latin. And on the left, I've now seen highlighted all the viral taxa from which samples that include viruses um, from pigs are obtained. Very simple, but very impactful sort of relationship here. People can now go in and grab all the viruses from pigs, all the viruses from uh, great apes, viruses from whatever taxonomy group they wish. And again, very simple sort of curation steps lead to this very impactful uh, functionality. All the um, normalized metadata is made available for the NCBI virus resource. And this data selection interface sort of leverages the normalized data to provide uh, easy search. And this normalized metadata can be downloaded for use in analysis and tabular formats. And so folks can take it offsite and use it as they need. As you can see here, highlighting the green, our curation efforts have now touched on many different uh, metadata and sequence quality qualifiers, and we continue to build more. So you guys might've heard a couple of years ago, there was kind of a big virus thing, um, and it proved to be quite challenging to um, our curation efforts. Um, SARS-CoV-2 
has really caused an ex extreme sort of sequencing effort across the, the globe. And that more than 4 million SARS-CoV-2 sequences have been submitted to GenBank over the last couple of years. And this volume has really um, kind of forced us to think about uh, curation in different ways over the last couple of years. And it's focused our attention on gene and protein annotation and the need to provide up-to-date high quality annotation for all these sequences, all 4 million of them. And Eric Malbrocki is gonna talk more about this in his talk. Uh, it's also forced us to try to provide lineage information. We need to classify sequences into WHO and CDC monitored lineage. And then also forces us to think really hard about data quality because there's been quite a bit of variable sequence data and metadata quality associated with these sequences. Um, this has led to an initial response, which included the creation of reference genome that's now used widely throughout the bioinformatic community, um, improved our, our metadata normalization pipelines to serve this sort of SARS-CoV-2 specific use cases, and then integrating community tools like Pangolin um, to provide lineage information and working with community-driven metadata and outreach improvement efforts um, from groups like Public Health Alliance for Genomic epidemiology and others to improve the quality of metadata as it came into um, GenBank. And this kind of is a theme, let's get the data as clean as we can before it even gets to GenBank, and that gives us less to do on the back end. But one of the problems we, we kept seeing over and over again was the inconsistent data quality of the sequence itself. And so we turned our attention to sort of trying to solve this. And just for quick background, next generation genomic sequencing, um, it requires individual sequence reads to capture the diversity of sequence sample. And genomes are reconstructed from many subgenomic sequence reads. Uh, consensus genomes like the ones you see in GenBank are assembled using software packages. And these assembly processes are highly influenced by sequence quality and the software parameters. And you might imagine those two um, sequence quality and software parameters lead to a lot of inconsistent data. So we investigated using the NIH sequence read archive to try to uh, take a closer look at uh, sequence quality. And so the SRA is the world's largest publicly available repository of raw next generation sequencing data, also maintained by NCPI and NLM. And it supports findable, accessible, interoperable, reproducible data practices because the raw sequences can be used to reconstruct genomes and identify nucleotide variations. So we started building pipelines to leverage the SRA to investigate viral sequence quality issues, as well as trying to develop viral um, nucleotide polymorphism calling uh, processes. And about a year and some change ago, we started partnering with the NIH Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions, Vaccines, Tracking Resistance, and Coronavirus Evolution Initiative, ah, Active Trace, um, who was interested in monitoring global emergence and circulation of SARS-CoV-2 mutations and cross-referencing initial sequence data against a database of experimentally or clinically characterized variants. Um, so the variants could be prioritized and used in critical path experimental assays. And the take home here is they needed accurate genome sequences to track individual mutations and share genome sequences with experimentalists. So working with Trace, we built a um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, genetic variation analysis pipeline, that's cloud-based pipeline ingest uh, SRA data when possible and GenBank data when SRA data doesn't exist for a particular sample. And it includes three interfaces with curation, one is at the level of genetic variation analysis itself, where we work with the trace group to come up with standard operating procedures and then update our pipelines to make them as accurate as possible. And then a lineage definition curation group um, identifies new lineages and then develops explicit sequence definitions for these. This is the actual mutations um, involved in each particular lineage. And then an experimental and epitope curation team um, well, actually two, one from NCATS and one from NCBI that are bringing experimental and epitope data and integrating it with the um, variant analysis data into the trace report that we delivered NIH leadership. So 5.4 million unique samples have been successfully analyzed, including 2.4 million SRA samples by this pipeline. Over 148 lineages have been defined, tracked, and shared with the community. 
And analyzed samples are shared in the variant call format on publicly accessible cloud platforms. And this allows people to go and take a look at those samples and ask questions like, does the sequence data actually cover the entire genome? How many reads actually support a given mutation call? And this is really impactful because people can use metrics and decide what data is best for them and their use cases. Uh, sample analysis results and metadata are also shared in publicly accessible cloud platforms. And the data is searchable in these cloud, cloud platforms by nucleotide and uh, amino acid polymorphisms, as well as lineages and sample metadata. So you can go and search the data by a number of critical parameters. So this is probably the most important slide. What did we learn from all this? Well, we learned that big data requires new curation processes that really leverage um, sort of the whole data flow from the building up of the assemblies, the interrogation of what the assemblies tell us about um, nucleotide polymorphisms, and you know the access and the accessibility of the metadata that describes um, those sequences. And so we're building some new resources to integrate some of the data that and uh, data flows that have come out of this uh, two-year experiment. Um, and we're also exploring integration of other viral data into those new, newly developed data flows. So other viruses like influenza and, and, uh, and human pathogens that you've all heard about, but maybe also bacteriophages and, and other viruses that would um, really benefit from some of the curation flows. And then ultimately we're looking now to how do we leverage our open access cloud platforms to federate community data, data and metadata curation and analysis efforts. Again, I see us part of the community and these cloud platforms allow us to put the data out there in front of the community and perhaps link it to other community efforts that are involved in also trying to improve the interoperability of the data. So huge number of people involved in this group. I like very much to thank them all and a number of critical um, partnerships that made all of this possible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rodney. That was a very interesting talk and just an amazing impact of SARS-CoV uh, on all of this and the variation in sequence quality. We'll do one very quick question here, if you can give me a quick response so I can pretty much keep us on time. Uh, a question, are there efforts to standardize viral variants similar to HGVS for humans? Yeah, so that's, a, the, <laughs> welcome to communities. Um, so we have been looking into that and obviously there, there are several different sort of uh, groups of stakeholders that are prioritizing certain concepts when you come up with variants. And that's one of the reasons we developed the explicit definitions so our definitions really don't depend on the prioritization. They are simply a statement of grouping. We group these things based on this criteria and anyone can reuse that grouping in the way they want to. Um, I would imagine as we go forward here that uh, there will be more discussion about standardizing those approaches. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to our fourth speaker. There's Valerie, get her slides up. Our next presentation by Valerie Schneider is the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on the NCBI curation landscape. Valerie is the Deputy Director of Sequence Offerings and the head of the Seek Plus program in NCBI's Information Engineering Branch. In these roles, she coordinates efforts associated with the curation, enhancement, and organization of sequence data, and provides oversight for multiple teams providing tools and resources that enable the public to access, analyze, and visualize biomedical data such as RefSeq and BLAST. Today, she'll provide a bird's eye view of how NCBI's existing curation processes were applied and modified to address the influx of SARS-CoV-2 sequence data. And she'll also share some of the new curation activities instantiated for SARS-CoV-2 associated literature and public health resources and their applicability to other content. She'll point out how a mix of automated and manual processes were involved in both and how that balance evolved with time. Take it away, Valerie. You're muted, Valerie. Thank you, I say. Thanks for the introduction. And I also wanna thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share with you today about the impact that SARS-CoV-2 has had on the NCBI curation landscape. 
So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the many talented and dedicated scientists, programmers, data wranglers, project and product managers at NCBI who support data in all its forms, as it's their work I'm going to be telling you about. And I've also called out the product leads associated with the curation examples I'll be sharing today on individual slides. So today I'll begin by providing some background on resource organization at NCBI, followed by some examples of curation responses to SARS-CoV-2, and then I'll round out the presentation by talking about the evolving balance of manual and automated curation. So NCBI's mission is to develop new information technologies to aid in the understanding of fundamental molecular and genetic processes that, under, that control health and disease. And that mission is carried out by three complementary branches, IEB, IRB, and CBB. And today I'll primarily be sharing the impact that SARS-CoV-2 had on the curation landscape associated with IEB, which is the information engineering branch, which is responsible for designing and building NCBI's production software and databases. So offerings are key services provided by IEB and over 125 websites, FTP sites, tools, APIs, and services are, offer, are organized into these 15 offerings which serve one or more of the communities that rely on NCBI. And any given offering is an umbrella to a suite of related products. So for example, the GenBank offering encompasses data submission platforms, QAQC services, as well as the taxonomy bio project and biosample products. But regardless of the specific offering or data type, data flows through NCBI largely through the stages shown here. And at all stages, there are a combination of automated and manual processes that work together to deliver content to users in a variety of forms. So when the pandemic emerged, NCBI pivoted to provide support for SARS-CoV-2 data and research needs. We created a new landing page to help users discover and access these new SARS-CoV-2 resources, and the curation activities I'll be telling you about today all involve resources that can be accessed from this page. We also updated our submission processes to keep up with the rapid explosion of sequence data, and we also updated the pre-existing NCBI virus resource that you heard about from Rodney to create an interactive SARS-CoV-2 data hub dashboard that supported uh, discovery and analysis. You also heard about how we put raw and processed SARS-CoV-2 uh, data into the AWS registry of open data to facilitate its analysis. And lastly, I'll just mention that Datasets, which is a new NCBI data delivery product, provided web command line and programmatic interfaces supporting the efficient download of SARS-CoV-2 genome and protein packages. Nearly every IEB offering, ranging from GenBank to literature to RefSeq to the genetic testing registry and actually beyond, was a part of this pivot, as is evidenced here by these recent headlines from the NCBI Insights blog that highlight uh, COVID-related activities over the last couple of years. And so for my next few slides, I'll just use some specific examples of each to highlight how SARS-CoV-2 changed this landscape of curation. I've included this slide here showing the growth in the number of SARS-CoV-2 sequences released from GenBank as a visual reminder of the rapid growth in sequence data that the pandemic brought on. And this slide ends in February, but today in GenBank we have more than 4 million SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences. And while I'll point out that that's a lot of SARS-CoV-2 sequences, it's kind of interesting to reflect that they still represent less than 2% of the total number of sequences in GenBank today. So when it comes to curation at scale, NCBI has been in, in this business in the production area for, for quite a while. So let's take a look at some of the curation activities. Biosample is a product in the GenBank offering, and it's um, an example of a submission-related resource that modified its curation activities to better manage the influx of data. So Biosample has long used packages, which represent broad categories of sample types to help guide submitters into providing the appropriate attributes uh, by which to describe their samples. And so we created two new packages with a sharp focus on what the community needs to support surveillance, one for clinical samples and one for wastewater surveillance samples. The required attributes include those that are considered for the useful uh, rapid analysis and traceback of SARS-CoV-2 cases. And additionally, um, optional attributes include those specific to SARS-CoV-2 samples, such as uh, host uh, travel history or antiviral treatment. Biosample also instantiated two new curations on the inputs, both of which should enhance the fairness of the data. The first is an ISO collection date autocorrection, which is now done actually to all new biosample submissions, not just those associated with SARS-2. Um, and it's now also been applied retroactively to all data in biosample. The second is an automated geographic loca location harmonization. And while 
the field has always been validated at the country level. We added extra validation for American SAR samples so that a state or territory information was provided anywhere. It was autocorrected to the format that's shown here on the slide. And so based on an early snapshot of the data, it seems that about 49% of records would have been corrected in this way. I'll point out though that there's a manual element to the curation because when the state can't de be detected automatically, it is sent for manual review. The next example I'll share is taken from the SARS-CoV-2 assembly submission processing pipeline that's illustrated here on the right. And Eric Naraki will be talking about specific elements of this process in significantly more detail. So I'll just sort of skim through here to say that upon submission, NCBI provides several automated validations, checking attributes of the sequence, as well as the source from which it's derived. And to promote faster processing, we instantiated a, an option for users to skip identified problem sequences and continue with submission of good sequences rather than stopping the whole pipeline. And sequences that pass the initial validation are run through Vader, a tool that does additional sequence validation and feature annotation, and I'll let Eric tell you all about that. The next slide here highlights COVID-19-related curation activities by RefSeq, and RefSeq uh, provides stable reference sequences for genome annotation, gene identification and characterization, as well as other analyses. And one curation activity was the production of a COVID-19 gene set, and the effort updated human COVID-19-related RefSeq and gene records, both with summary data, um, as well as COVID-19-related attributes using the data sources that are shown here. And there's now 141 curated genes in this data set. A second curation activity for the offering was the creation of a RefSeq functional elements data subset for coronavirus host human host gene regulatory elements, and there are now 50 of those in that data set. So both RefSeq efforts relied on manual curation, but made use of a mix of pre-existing automated and manual processes that had already been, been instantiated for RefSeq curation in general. Moving on, we'll take a look at PubChem, which is an open chemistry database at NCBI. And PubChem doesn't have curation staff, but they integrate many curated resources. And PubChem wanted uh, any useful COVID-19 related information involving chemicals or biological targets to be highlighted along with any evidence that might be available. And so on the right here, you can see the approach that they took that has three main parts. The first includes a specialized rapid update scheme that involves a semi-manual check of PubChem contributors for curated COVID-19 content, weekly updates of appropriate content, and then searching for additional data sources. The second part involved identifying chemicals and biological targets in PubChem that are mentioned in PubMed abstracts associated with COVID-19. And then the last part involved changes to PubChem data systems to um, put on appropriate uh, tags and highlight COVID-19 content. In the next example I'm gonna share, uh, the NIH preprint pilot uh, comes from the literature offering. This pilot launched in June, 2020 with the goal of making preprints reporting NIH funded research discoverable in PMC and PubMed. And the first phase is preprints on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 research. And in this phase, NLM's curation efforts are limited to content that's included in the iSearch COVID-19 portfolio tool that was developed by the NIH Office of Portfolio Analysis. Early workflows that NLM has employed for curating preprints with um, NIH support include uh, searching for available author affiliation metadata, as well as text mining acknowledgements for NIH awards. And to date, there are more than 3,000 in-scope preprints that have been made searchable in NLM databases and have been accessed by more than 3 million users in PubMed Central. I'll also note here that clinicaltrials.gov links applicable records to PMC preprints. And so just very briefly touching on clinicaltrials.gov, they are another example of a resource that modified their existing curation activities to manage the influx of COVID-19 related data. They prioritize curation of COVID-19 trials pro and provide expedited processing and in fact, one-to-one -one assistance for COVID-19 related registrations. And in doing so, uh, clinicaltrials.gov serves as a platform now for rapid dissemination of COVID-19 studies and summary results. So there are many other examples illustrating the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on the curation landscape at NCBI that I'd, I'd love to share, but since we're nearly out of time, I'd like to end by taking a quick look at an example that highlights the case for both manual and automated curation processes in response to an emergent public health situation like COVID-19. So LitCOVID is a research project from NCBI's computational biology branch. Uh, to create a curated literature hub for tracking up-to-date scientific information about COVID-19. 
It does curation at scale using a two-step approach in which articles are retrieved daily from PubMed via an eUtils query. And then search results are manually reviewed with assistance from an automated machine learning and text classification algorithm to identify relevant search results. And relevant articles in lit COVID are then manually assigned into eight broad categories as applicable. NCBI originally considered undertaking an effort to integrate lit COVID into PubMed, one of the production resources. And in doing so, we asked ourselves several questions about how this might work. Would it be a link out to lit COVID from PubMed searches, or would we incorporate lit COVID searches into PubMed search results somehow? But perhaps even more importantly, could we reliably uh, base our production system on a manually curated research project. And so in considering that last point, we decided to shift uh, the curation plan just a little bit. So rather than integrate uh, lit COVID into PubMed, we pivoted to a bona fide approach in which we integrated lit COVID concepts into PubMed clinical queries. And so PubMed clinical queries deliver categorized search results using customized filter that are based on manually defined uh, PubMed queries. And the COVID-19 filter categories shown in the image here map to the lit COVID categories to which the curators typically manually assign those citations. And so this allowed us to achieve our goal of quickly facilitating discovery of citations about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 in PubMed. And while the results in here don't benefit from the AI-based approach used by lit COVID, the approach um, insulated this trusted production level resource from reliance on a manual step that might not be sustainable uh, in the, the long term as part of a research progress, uh, process or in the field of continuing data growth. And so the take home uh, from this is really that both manual and automated curation are essential to curation at scale and the curation landscape. And what we see is that it's clear that automated approaches, um, including those using AI and machine learning are becoming increasingly necessary to keep up with data growth. But manual curation remains important both in training methods and in refining findings. And when it comes to curation at scale in the context of production level resources, we have to become increasingly vigilant that, man that manual curation, which can be rate limiting or a non-scalable activity is appropriately placed into the curation workflow so as not to limit curation at scale. So the evolution of automated versus manual curation processes may not just be in the area of replacing one with the other, but really strategically positioning them in such efforts. So with that, I will just wrap things up. We've looked at a number of NCBI resources and how they responded to the emerging COVID-19 pandemic, both in terms of uh, using existing curation processes and developing new ones. We've also now looked a little bit at the balance of manual and curation, man manual and automated curation, how it may evolve with time. So I want to thank everyone for their attention, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you, Valerie. We are sort of running short of time. I don't see any questions currently in the Q&A, so um, I want to thank you for that presentation. It was just an amazing, you know, impact of, of COVID on research activities and um, very interesting references to this, the, the balance between manual and automated curation. So we will move on to our final speaker. The final presentation is by Eric Naraki and is entitled Automated Validation and Annotation of SARS-CoV-2 Sequences for GenBank Using Vader. Eric has been a staff scientist at NCBI since 2015. Before that, he worked in Sean Eddy's lab at Johnny Yellow Research Campus in Virginia, where he developed computational methods and software for structural RNA analysis. He still works on RNA, but at NCBI, he has also started working on viral annotation and along with Alejandro Schaefer, the NCBI virus team, and the GenBank team developed the Vader software package that he is talking about today. Go ahead, Rodney. Thanks, Susan. Um, and thanks for the, um, sorry, thanks to the organizers for allowing me to talk today. So um, I work uh, with GenBank and there's many different types of indexers at NLM, um, but at GenBank, when we talk about indexers, we're talking about expert curators of biological sequences. Um, and one of the jobs that those indexers have is to look at sequences that are submitted by submitters around the world and determine if the sequence data and the metadata associated with it should be accepted into GenBank, or if there's some issue or problem with it, in which case it shouldn't be, and it should be returned to the submitter with some explanation. And as you can imagine, as sequence data continues to grow, 
we try to automate this as much as possible to help out the indexers. And one way that we've done that is by developing a software package called Vader, which stands for um, Viral Annotation Definer. And this tool is used for reference-based annotation of viral sequences. So given a ref seek of a virus, it uses, uh, it, it, it validates incoming sequences based on that reference and annotates features in that sequence based on what's in the ref seek. Um, we have originally developed this for norovirus and dengue virus, but it's a general tool that we've applied to SARS-CoV-2 since um, the pandemic started. So what Vader does is it automatically looks at sequences and tries to identify unusual features or unexpected features um, of the sequence. And if it does, it sometimes reports what are called fat fatal alerts. And any sequence that has zero fatal alerts is considered to pass. And any passing sequence can automatically be deposited into GemBank and published and usually available within minutes of submission. Um, any sequence that does have fatal alerts um, does not pass. And then sometimes those sequences are, the problem is so obvious that the Vader output can be directly sent back to the submitter as an explanation. Sometimes those sequences are looked at by the indexer who can decide that they're okay, in which case they go in or they're not okay, in which case they go back to the submitter. So I don't have time in this talk to go into to much detail about what Vader does, but I will try to give a brief summary. So there's four main stages. The first thing it does is given each sequence, it tries to classify that sequence. So for norovirus, there's 11 different ref seeks that it uses. And so it finds the best matching one, and then it uses a local alignment algorithm to determine if the entire sequence matches norovirus or if there's some regions that look like they're dissimilar, um, in which case it would report an alert for that. Then it aligns the full sequence, so a global alignment of the sequence from end to end um, to the model and uses that alignment to map the features. And finally, it uses BLASTX to, do, to validate the protein coding potential of any predicted CDS regions. And the reason there's these four different stages or, or one of the reasons is they each use different algorithms and are able to identify different types of um, problems at each stage. So just one example, in the alignment stage, if you have this sequence S coming in, it might be a dengue sequence zero type one, it would align the sequence um, to the ref seek and then these vertical lines indicate features in the ref seek. So it just simply maps them on based on the alignment. And it would identify things like early stop codons in the polypeptide, um, polyprotein of dengue um, at this stage. And there's actually many more things that will identify problems with start codons, stop codons. Um, in, in different stages, there's different problems that are detected. So there's up to 70 different problems it detects um, in, in all the stages. And so I mentioned that we use Vader initially for norovirus and dengue virus. This gives you some statistics on those two viruses. So they're about seven to 11,000 nucleotides long, the full genomes. We have tens of thousands of them in GenBank, 100,000 dengue. But most of them are actually partial sequences. So only five to 10% of them are near full length or full length genomes. And you can see that norovirus on average are about 80% similar to each other, whereas dengue virus is about 94% similar to each other. Um, and if we look at how well Vader performs on those sequences, it, is, uh, it does take 40 seconds to, to annotate a full length sequence of norovirus, which is arguably slow, but given the number of sequences we have, we could align all the full length, or we could process all the full length sequences in just one day. And we're not, this is all the sequences in GenBank, we're not getting um, that many new sequences. So these are reasonable times that we can deal with. Now for SARS-CoV-2, as Valerie showed, uh, and Rodney alluded to, we have 
many more sequences. So by the end of 2020, we had tens of thousands of sequences per month. By the end of 2021, we had um, hundreds of thousands of sequences per month coming in. So if we look at how Vader performs on SARS-CoV-2, it's much slower. And that's because SARS-CoV-2 is actually relatively long for a virus. So it's 30 KB and there's many more sequences and many, almost all of them are full length. Another feature is that the, a lot of SARS-CoV-2 sequences contain long stretches of N nucleotides, which are ambiguous nucleotides um, that are placed in when the, the true identity of the nucleotide is unknown. So that, that's very common in SARS-CoV-2 sequences, but they are very similar to each other, um, on average 99% similar. But if we look at how Vader performs, it takes over five minutes just to, to process a single sequence on one computer, and the memory requirement is actually much higher. So it requires 64 gigs of RAM. This has to do with the, the fact that the, some of the algorithms it uses scale with the square of the length of the sequence. If we looked at how long it would take to annotate all 1.6 million sequences, it's on the order of 17 years. Um, so that's too slow. So we basically just had to address these issues and make it faster. So I mentioned the ends, the high frequency of ends in SARS-CoV-2. The way that the reason that's a problem is because Vader is based on looking for similar similarity with the RefSeq and any regions that aren't similar, it's going to think are problematic and ca cause a fatal alert that those sequences will then not pass. So what we did is we identified, we implemented a pre-processing step that identifies these regions of ends and just replaces them with the expected nucleotides from the reference. And that actually performs pretty well with uh, all the sequences, well, with in, typically for the sequences that we've seen so far. Another thing that we did was to make alignment much faster. And we took advantage of the fact that the sequences are so similar to the RefSeq we used BLAST N, which does very well on highly similar sequences, to get a first pass alignment of the sequence. Now, sometimes that sequence is the full length of this, sorry, sometimes that alignment is the full length of the sequence, but sometimes it's not. And if it's not, we have these regions that are not aligned at the end, and we have to align those separately because we need a global alignment to map all the features um, from the RefSeq. So the way we do that is we actually started using a different program called GL Search. This is different than the original program Vader used because it's more, and the reason we did that is it's more memory efficient. And so we align the ends and then we kind of combine or join the, the alignments together to get the global alignment. And that's kind of crude, but it work, it's fast and it works well. The final thing that we did is to parallelize um, to parallelize Vader. And we took advantage of the fact that GL search uses less memory, only two gigs of memory instead of 64. And so now when we get an input sequence, we simply split it up, input sequence file rather, we split it up into chunks of sequences. And we give um, each CPU on multi-core hosts, which are pretty, almost all computers are like that now. We put, we put, each chunk on a different CPU of the, of the computer, and we process them in parallel. And then we merge the results at the end when all the chunks are finished. And so the impact that has on the speed is pretty dramatic. If we look at how fast for um, beta 1.0, if we look at 100,000 sequences, it would have taken 9,000 hours to annotate those. With the new, um, the latest version with these new strategies, it takes, it's now about 130 times faster, and that's on a single processor. If we parallelize the eight processors, which is what we do in GenBank, we get about a thousand fold speed up. And you can go even to more um, cores or more, more par parallelization if you want. So we now think that Vader is fast enough to deal with the hundreds of thousands of sequences we're getting every month, um, which is a good thing. Um, and this is my last slide before the acknowledgements. So 
we I talked about how we made it faster, but we've done more than that. Um, we've had 14 releases of Vader since the pandemic started. One of the things we did was to add additional models. We had a model for the alpha variants, a model for the B1525 variant, and one for a deletion, a specific deletion. The reason we had to do that is because alpha sequences that were perfectly fine were failing Vader um, because of an early stop in the ORF8 um, CDS. But as, a, as we saw more and more sequence divergence, we decided to take a different tack and allow certain fatal alerts for the non-essential ORFs um, in SARS-CoV-2 to not cause a sequence to fail. And instead they just make that CDS and miscellaneous feature. And then we were able to actually drop these models and now we only use one model again. So there's been a lot of trying to keep up with the sequence divergence as we see it throughout the past two years. So I just want to acknowledge Alejandro Schaefer was involved at the beginning. He's since moved to NCI. Linda Yankee's in charge of um, the GemMake team. Vince Calhoun's in charge of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, just acknowledge the leadership, David Landsman, uh, Kim Pruitt, and this software is based on software by others. Um, so I'll stop there and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Eric, that for the, the impact of Vader is very impressive. I have a, one quick question that um, we'll ask if we can do a quick question and answer. Do you have plans for how to deal with potential new variants, SARS-CoV-2 variants? Um, well, we have to kind of see. So our plan is to kind of wait and see and then try to deal with them um, because we can't really predict how they'll perform in Vader or how Vader will handle them. And we just kind of have to wait for that data to come in and then try to adjust potentially by making new model or a new um, reference model, but it depends. Okay, thank you so much. So this concludes session seven. Uh, thank you to our NLM speakers and for their excellent presentations and to attendees for your questions. Um, I wanna say a special thank you to uh, Rosarda who uh, not only uh, spent just an amazing amount of time putting together this this workshop, but also found time to put together a presentation for us today. Also want to thank you, Rosarda, for all the support that you've given to us as session chairs. So obviously COVID loomed large in these presentations. And I think that's really a, obviously a segue into our next session, which is the panel discussion on curation at scale in a time of pandemics. We have about an eight minute break here and we will reconvene at 1.10 Eastern time for that panel discussion. So thank you all again and see you soon.